For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. The NFL Draft is notorious for smoke screens. Lots and lots of smoke screens. A smoke screen is when a team fakes their interest in one player in order to get the player that they actually want. As an example, let's say at this upcoming NFL Draft, that the Los Angeles Chargers really want to get Michigan quarterback J.J. McCarthy, because Jim Harbaugh loves the guy for obvious reasons. He knows him best, he wants to reunite with him, and wants to trade Justin Herbert so they can just acquire a boatload of picks and really do a hard rebuild. No, this is not happening, this is just a hypothetical scenario, but go with me here. Now teams are thinking, oh crap, if we want J.J. McCarthy, we're going to have to leapfrog the Chargers and jump up to number four. So a team does that, takes McCarthy, and it leaves the Chargers with the man they actually always wanted, Ohio State wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr. Since they lost their top receivers in Mike Williams and Keenan Allen due to salary cap related reasons. That's a smokescreen. Do you think the Chargers have interest in one player? They never really had interest in him. Someone bites, and the Chargers get the player they always wanted. They were never going to take McCarthy. What we're talking about in today's video is not a smokescreen. In fact, I'm not quite sure what the heck this is. This was a team flat out saying, we are going to take this player if he is on the board. This was a team outright saying, I don't think this man is going to fall to us, but if he does, oh my god, we are going to run up to the podium with his name on our card, turn it into the league in five seconds flat, and we're going to celebrate like there's no tomorrow. This was a team making their intentions incredibly known, and then, the time comes to take the player, and they opt not to, changing their mind at the last second. I can't even say it was the general manager in question lying, because I genuinely think the GM wanted to take the guy. It wasn't an attempt to fool other teams, because they never expected this man to even fall to them in the first place. This was just one of the most bizarre draft day situations, that roughly 30 years later, we're taking a deep dive into today. Because this is the story behind the man you've been watching this whole time. Texas A&M running back Leland McElroy. The Buffalo Bills, the 1996 NFL Draft, General Manager John Butler, and the bizarre incident involving all parties. Before I talk about the bizarre situation in question, we need some context to understand just who this man right here, Leland McElroy, was. And what the projections were on McElroy heading into the draft. The year is 1996, and coming out of Texas A&M is a running back so good that he was not only projected as a super high pick, but was invited to attend the draft inside Madison Square Garden, a man by the name of Leland McElroy. If you want to talk about an absolutely electric player who could make magic happen anytime he touched the ball and would cause absolute chaos for opposing defenses and front sevens, McElroy was your man. As he finished his three years at Texas A&M, with over 3,000 yards from scrimmage, including a 1995 campaign where he had over 1,100 yards rushing, over 1,500 yards from scrimmage, and 16 total touchdowns. He could return kicks. He returned four kicks for a touchdown on 30 touches, so about one out of every seven kicks that touched his hands went for six. He also led the NCAA in 1993 with three kickoff return touchdowns and 39.3 yards per kick return. He could pick up huge gains. His 8.5 yards per carry as a freshman in 1993 was not only the top total in the Southwest Conference, but was the top total in the NCAA amongst all qualified running backs. He could find the end zone. His 13 rushing touchdowns in 1995 was the top total in the Southwest Conference, and his 40 total touchdowns between rushing, receiving, and kicking was the 8th most in the history of the Southwest Conference. He also finished in the top three of the conference in that category all three years that he played for the Aggies. And he was a consensus All-American in 1994, leaving Texas A&M after 1995 near the top of the leaderboard in just about every major rushing category and yardage category. It seemed very apparent that McElroy was going to go super high in the draft. And for the Buffalo Bills, this meant that they wouldn't be able to get him barring a trade-up. In 1995, Buffalo finished the season with a 10-6 record, making it to the divisional round of the playoffs and winning the AFC East. 
so they were not going to be in any position to draft the man, seeing as they had the 24th pick in a 30-team draft. McElroy was the second-best running back in the class, according to a lot of people, only behind Nebraska running back Lawrence Phillips. There was no chance he was slipping to 24, and all of the mock drafts seemed to reflect that. But then, Mel Kuyper Jr., the most prominent draft expert out there, put out his final mock draft just days before the real thing was set to happen on April 20th. And in that mock draft, he did something that he hadn't done before. He had Leland McElroy slipping all the way to the 24th pick with the Buffalo Bills. Did Buffalo really need a running back in the first round? Probably not. They had the sixth most rushing yards in football in 1995. They got over 900 yards from scrimmage out of their seventh round pick from that year, Derek Holmes. And they still had Thurman Thomas, the future Hall of Fame running back coming off a thousand yard season. But the reasoning made sense in a lot of ways. Number one, Thomas was going to be on the wrong side of 30, and he was showing signs of declining. Yes, he had over a thousand yards rushing, but by every metric, he had his worst season since he was a rookie back in 1988, and he wasn't getting any younger. Number two, Buffalo was a team that loved to run the football. They had more carries than any team in football in 1995, and if you only have Holmes and Thomas, that might not be enough to truly pound the rock and keep fresh legs in at all times. Plus, Buffalo couldn't run the ball well in their divisional round loss to the Pittsburgh Steelers, in a game that you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. That's one of the reasons they lost, as Thomas and Holmes combined for just 60 yards rushing on 17 carries, so barely over 3 yards a carry. Get a game-changing back like McElroy, who could also return kicks, which was a massive problem for Buffalo, as they ranked dead last in football in yards per kick return, and were more than a full yard worse than the third worst team in the league, and everything changes. McElroy might be the missing piece in this Buffalo offense. And a reporter asked Bill's general manager, John Butler, about McElroy in light of the mock draft. Now, when a general manager is usually asked about a player like this, he'll say something along the lines of, McElroy is a very good player, and if he's on the board, we've got a lot to think about. Or, McElroy would definitely help out our running game and kick return game, and we need to improve there. So I could see how he'd fit in. Or, we're looking at quite a few players with that 24th pick and he's one of them. All of these lines are generic general managers speak that don't really mean a whole lot or tell us a lot about what a team is going to do. You don't want to show your hand to everyone. But Butler did not do that. In fact, he did the exact opposite of that. Because when Butler was asked about McElroy, he made it very clear that if he was on the board with the 24th pick, that he was going to celebrate. Heck, he might have jumped through a table. He might have gone to Niagara Falls and cannonballed into the falls. That's how elated he would have been. The possibilities were endless. Because when Butler spoke on McElroy, he said, If Leland McElroy were a fall to pick 24, you'd see the greatest dancing going on. This old fat body would just be wiggling. This is a very, very talented person. Running backs you can't have enough of. Boy, if Mel Kuyper knows something, I wish he'd call me. It would be great to see that kid fall that far, but we just don't envision it. He then added, He's such a fine kickoff returner, he could help us right away there. And in this scheme, injuries happen. This wouldn't be something where you would say, Oh, they're overloaded there. Not when you have a player that highly graded. Well, uh, that leaves no room for interpretation, right? That leaves nothing to the imagination. In no uncertain terms, Butler flat out said, there is no way that McElroy is falling to us, but if he does, it will be like we won the lottery, and we're 100% taking him. He fills a need, he's a great player, and we're taking him. That's the response that the Jaguars give this year if someone asks Trent Bulky, what happens if Marvin Harrison Jr. is still on the board when you're on the clock with pick number 17? That's the response the Vikings give this year if someone asks them, what happens if you're on the clock at pick 11, and Caleb Williams is still there. I think it's safe to say that we answer a question by saying, I'll dance around and be so happy if, by some miracle, this were to happen, that you make it pretty well known who you're looking at and who you're going to take. But again, just like Butler said, 
there was no way that this was going to happen. Keep dreaming. Kuiper was just drumming up hype and manufacturing controversy. There was no way that McElroy, considering how good he was and how versatile he was, was actually going to fall all the way to pick number 24. So this was just going to be some fantasy for the Buffalo Bills and general manager John Butler. And then the draft happened. And all of a sudden, just as Kuiper predicted, and just as very few others, including Butler, envisioned, McElroy began sliding. He was projected by some as the second running back off the board behind Lawrence Phillips. He was projected as a top 15 or maybe even a top 10 draft pick. He was in the green room for a reason. And now, here the Buffalo Bills were, sitting at pick number 24, and Leland McElroy was there for the taking. His name had not been called yet. There he was, the successor to Thurman Thomas, the answer to their kick return game, their anchor that was going to allow the team to rotate running backs in and out whenever they felt like it. John Butler was wiggling his fat body around. He was jumping for joy. He couldn't believe his luck. He was about to get Leland McElroy, which is why with the 24th pick of the 1996 NFL Draft, the Buffalo Bills chose, as you guessed, Eric Mole, there you go, wide receiver from Mississippi State. So, uh, how the heck did that happen? Again, this wasn't a smokescreen whatsoever by Butler and company. He really wanted McElroy. The Bills took all 15 minutes off the clock to make their pick because there was such deliberation amongst everyone which way they should go. And Butler flat out admitted that he was not lying or trying to deceive anyone with those comments about McElroy. As he said, I wanted to do that dance for you. A lot of people in the media said that McElroy would be there at pick number 24, and I didn't believe it. But we knew we had a need at wide receiver. We knew we had to address that. When you get to that point and you have to make that choice, it was a good choice to have to make. Two outstanding players still on your board. We selected Eric. Butler was going to do the dance, but he decided to go in a completely different direction to the surprise of a lot of people, including maybe even John Butler himself. I'd always view it like this. Suppose your dream school is Harvard. You visited the campus, you loved it. You've been infatuated with Harvard for years. You know people that went to Harvard who loved it. And you've always dreamed about stepping foot on that campus. However, your GPA isn't the best, and you don't have the most extensive extracurricular resume. So you apply to it as a dream school, but you manage your expectations, and you know you're not getting in. So you also apply to Virginia, and you really like Virginia. There's nothing wrong with going to Charlottesville in your mind. And not only do you get into Virginia, but you're mentally prepping for that to be your school. And then, Harvard comes in and says that you've been accepted. And it completely throws you for a loop. Because Harvard was your dream school, but you've been preparing to go to Virginia for the vast majority of your senior year now, and you don't really want to adjust those plans just because your dream school came back and said yes. I guess that's what Buffalo was thinking when they passed on this man right here. They were mentally preparing to draft Eric Moulds this entire time, or at the very least, a receiver. And then, McElroy just fell into their laps, and it was a pleasant shock, but it threw them completely off guard. This felt like a dream scenario for John Butler that they never really planned for or expected to happen. And when it actually did, even though it killed them on the inside, they had to stick to the original plan. Of course, the incredible part about this is that thank God that the Bills stuck to their original plan. Because if they had any regrets after night one of the draft or any second thoughts about taking Molds over McElroy, they were erased. Taking this man right here, Eric Molds over Leland McElroy, was 100% the right play. Molds played 10 seasons with the Bills posting 675 catches for 9,096 yards and 48 touchdowns, and making the Pro Bowl three times, making it in 1998, 2000, and 2002. He was also named an AP Second Team All-Pro in 1998 and 2002. The number one receiver in Bill's history from a receiving yardage standpoint is Andre Reid, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. The number two receiver, and the only other one to have at least 6,000 yards with the team, Eric Moulds. I'm actually kind of surprised he's not in the Bills Wall of Fame yet, but maybe soon. As for Leland McElroy, he got drafted by the Arizona Cardinals in the second round with pick number 32. 
and he played just two seasons in the NFL, with 729 rushing yards and three touchdowns. That's it. He was a gigantic bust, especially considering the hype surrounding him. For some perspective, Buffalo's seventh round pick from 1995, Derek Holmes, and the man who would have seen his playing time reduced significantly, had more yards from scrimmage as a rookie than McElroy had in his entire career. Advantage Buffalo in this one. Before going any further, if my voice sounds a bit weaker than it usually does, again, I'm just dealing with an ammonia right now, but it, I realize that if I talk a bit softer and talk a bit lighter than I usually do, then I can get by without coughing. So we're going to try that and see how that goes, and hopefully we get more content out that way. So thank you guys for bearing with me on that. Anyways, as for this video, what is crazy about the team behind me right here, the Buffalo Bills, is that John Butler was the general manager for the team all the way up until 2000. And he had plenty of chances to get Leland McElroy after this. He was cut from the Cardinals in 1997. 1998, signed with the Buccaneers, got cut midway through training camp. And yet, despite all those opportunities, Butler did not sign Leland McElroy. He was having no second thoughts. And even though he might have been wiggling when he was on the board at pick number 24, and he was still there, not even so much as an acknowledgement two years later, or even one year later, when the time came. Definitely made the right call here, taking Eric Moulds over Leland McElroy. Drafting this man right here, Eric Moulds, was one of the smartest decisions that general manager John Butler made during his time in Buffalo. And it's crazy how close it came to not happening, and how disastrous it could have been, with the Bills drafting one of their biggest busts in franchise history instead. No, John Butler was unable to wiggle immediately after drafting Moulds, but I'm sure he was wiggling for a good decade afterward, considering everything that Moulds did for the team on the field. Because unlike Leland McElroy, Eric Moulds fit the mold of a great draft pick. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com, and be sure to like and subscribe, as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.